Okay, Moby Dick chapter 4. So, the counterpane, which is a fancy word for blanket. I think this is a classic chapter where you see the blending of humor and figurative insight coming into play really heavily. I mean, I think a lot of people would skip over this chapter as being kind of just humorous, but I'm going to go through what I think are some mixed aspects here. So, I find the beginning image of the chapter just very funny. Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. So yes, lots of people and lots of critics will read this as, oh my god, how transgressive of Melville to throw in a homoerotic comment like, you'd almost thought I had been his wife. I just don't buy it. I mean, yeah, okay, fine, maybe there's those undertones there, but... You know, he and Queequeg are not gay, uh, at least not explicitly. Sure, you can argue about undertones, overtones, between tones, whatever type of tones you want, or whatever. I just find it a funny image, because not because of the gay aspect, which is totally fine. It's funny because of Ishmael's 180 degree reversal on what he was thinking in the last chapter, which is, oh my god, this guy's going to kill me, uh, to the point where he becomes a bosom friend in like, you know, a few pages. So, uh, we, we pass a few paragraphs, and then we get to this weird description of <laughs> this weird passage about Ishmael's past, where he feels like a hand is holding him when he was young. He would sleep in his bed. And I'll start here. At last, I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze and slowly waking from it, half steeped in dreams. Opened my eyes, and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in outer darkness. I remember, his stepmother forces him to go to bed early to punish him. Instantly, I felt a shock running through all my frame. Nothing was to be seen, nothing was to be heard, but a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane, and the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom to which the hand belonged seemed closely seated by my bedside. For what seemed ages piled on ages, I lay there, frozen with the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand, yet ever thinking that if I could but stir it one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this consciousness at last glided away from me, but waking in the morning, I shudderingly remembered it all. And for days and weeks and months afterwards, I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour, I often puzzle myself with it. So Ishmael will go on to parallel this strangeness that he felt while lying in bed to the strangeness of waking up with Queequeg. How does this intersect with the big ideas that we've been talking about? Because it's in yellow, you know that I'm going to go there. And in terms of truth and knowledge and understanding, this seems to do with the mystery of A, the supernatural, or experiences that cannot easily be categorized within uh, human understanding. And those could be supernatural, or they could be things so abstract as to be difficult for the human consciousness to explain, like infinity, or eternity, or <clears throat> like submolecular cellular interactions which have no bearing on lived phenomenological experience. And this is just one example of the natural human instinct, I think, to be mesmerized by those things that we can't categorize and to seek them out. And that should remind you even though what Ishmael is doing is seeking them out in his past and trying to understand them, that should remind you of the same type of rhetoric that was deployed in chapter one to talk about the whale as this image of an ocean and a world which is so hard to understand that it becomes tempting to be curious about it and seek it out. So while that's talking about seeking something out physically, and, and obviously figuratively as well, this is figurative, but not through the register of physicality, but through the register of memory. And of course, side by side with this passage is a hilarious passage about Queequeg's uh, grasp on Ishmael being so strong that, que uh, that Ishmael can't get out. For though I tried to move his arm, unlock his bridegroom clasp, hey look, another youth deployment of the marriage imagery. Eh, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. Maybe there's homoerotic overtones, but I think it's more about the emotional connection they've drawn and how quickly it was drawn, but do as you will. Yet sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly as though naught but death could part us twain. I now strove to rouse him. Queek, queek! But his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over my neck feeling as if it were in a horse collar and suddenly felt a slight scratch. 
Throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk sleeping by the savage's side as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. What a phrase. How can you have a meditation on uh, memory and meaning and ununderstandability next to the phrase, a hatchet-faced baby? My, a pretty pickle, truly, thought I, a bed here in a strange house in the broad day with a cannibal and a tomahawk. Queequeg, in the name of goodness, Queequeg, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling, a loud, incessant expostulations upon the unbecomingness of his hugging a fellow male in a matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew back his arm, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog just from the water, and sat up in bed, stiff as a pike staff, looking at me and rubbing his eyes as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there though a dim consciousness of knowing something about me seems slowly dawning over him. I find it hilarious that Ishmael is wrestling Queequeg to get out of bed. There's some, that great phrase, the tomahawk-faced baby. Uh, pretty pickle, if you will. I just find that so fun. And in the same paragraph, you go back to this question of knowledge and understanding, and in this case, not about the metaphysical ununderstandability or mystery of the world, but about social relationships and social uh, expectations and norms because now we talk about Queequeg and where he is positions himself between various uh, frameworks for understanding. Thinks I Queequeg under the circumstances this is a very civilized overture. He says that he's going to dress first and then leave the room to Ishmael. But the truth is these savages have an innate sense of delicacy say what you will. It is marvelous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg because he treated me with so much civility and consideration while I was gu guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed, watching all his toilet motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg, you don't see every day, he and his ways were well worth the unusual regarding. I actually, sorry, I messed up the lead into this quotation. I'm talking about the next quotation. This quotation is somewhat interesting because it, it falls into line with the pattern of knowledge and understanding and mystery quotations that I referenced from chapter one to this chapter. Here, this positions not the dream, not the whale, but Queequeg as that kind of rare, difficult to understand, uh, almost ununderstandable or impassable uh, thing that motivates Ishmael's consciousness. So he kind of becomes the object in a certain way of Ishmael's desire to know or desire to understand at this particular moment. So the register is changing. We're talking about understanding supernatural dreams. We're talking about understanding the ocean slash the world slash life slash Queequeg. But nevertheless, Ishmael is constantly seeking to understand the ununderstandable or to interpret the somewhat difficult to interpret. Okay, back to humor. We just get some more fun passages about Queequeg dressing. He commenced dressing at top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by. And then, still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. So he's got a hat on, apparently no pants, and he's looking for his boots. What under the heavens he did it for, I cannot tell, but his next movement was to crush himself, boots in hand, and hat on, under the bed, when from sundry violent gaspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of, is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. So even though Queequeg is not wearing any pants in front of Ishmael and seemingly feels no shame, he goes under the bed in order to put on his boots. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a funny image. But then, of course, because this is Melville, we hop right back into a meditation on knowledge. And this is the passage I meant to refer to when I was talking about Queequeg's middle position in frameworks of understanding or knowledge or, or epistemic reference points. But Queequeg, do you see, was a creature in the transition state, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manner. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. If he had been a small degree civilized, he very probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all. But then if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting them under the bed to put them on. So this kind of tells us how our understanding or knowledge of the world is very shaped by the circumstances and societies we live in. It's tempting to think of ourselves as Cartesian subjects who can undergo the epistemic investigation of the world prima facie a priori, but nevertheless, Queequeg, with his hilarious kind of middle ground between wearing nothing and wearing a hat and boots but no pants, seems to demonstrate that many of our references for knowledge are societal and contingent. And thus, I go back to Blue, 
At last he emerged with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes and began creaking and limping about the room, as if, not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp, wrinkled cowhide ones, probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go of a bitter morning. And then we get some more fun Queequeg stuff down here as he goes to breakfast. I was watching to see where he kept his razor, and lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and striding up to the bit of a mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping, or rather, harpooning of his cheeks. So, he's using his harpoon to shave himself. Thinks I, Queequeg, this is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards, I wondered the less at this operation when I came to know what of fine steel the head of the harpoon is made, and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped in his great pilot monkey jacket, sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. Queequeg is this fascinating character who gets such absurd clown-like treatment from Melville in the same chapter where he gets deep respect and egalitarian treatment, especially for a book of 1851. He seems noble and dignified, but also hilarious and absurd. And I think readers have always been fascinated by not necessarily the extremity of his portrayal, but the kind of ambiguity of the portrayal of Queequeg as someone who is both in the context of the 19th century treated as a caricature of the noble savage, but also treated as truly uh, human and interesting. And his character development will continue to grow, obviously, as we get further into the book.